Yoga Nidra is one of the most common and beneficial yoga practices practiced globally today. And for this, we have to thank Swami Satyanand Saraswati, who got us started with the Yoga Nidra practice. In fact, it's very interesting because the first mention of Yoga Nidra comes in the ancient Indian texts, where Lord Vishnu is supposed to be residing, or rather reclining on his Anant Sheshnag, the serpent on which he rests. He rests in Yoga Nidra between each Yuga or Eon. So it's this idea of a very restful sleep between periods of activity that Yoga Nidra describes in the ancient texts. In the modern context, as I've mentioned, Swami Satyanand Saraswati in the 1960s worked very hard to put together the modern Yoga Nidra from Tantric Nyasa Kriya practices. What exactly are we talking about in Yoga Nidra? Why is it so important? In this 21st century yoga project, we are always keen to know how the ancient practices can transform our body, mind and prana. Now, it has a huge impact for two reasons. One, modern man doesn't have the time to train for years and years in classical yoga moving into meditation. In classical meditation, in yoga, once you have put your life in order, once the yamas, niyamas are in order, once the body can sit still, asana, once pranayam, you can hold your breath inside, kumbhak, once your sense withdrawal has happened, pratyahar, focus, dharan, then dhyan begins to happen. Now the tension in today's life is so high that most people are not really looking for meditation, they're looking for relaxation. This is the unique difference between classical yoga meditation and yoga nidra. For meditation in yoga, you require focus. You train your focus over the years. You train your body, breath and mind so that meditation starts to happen spontaneously. It's not a technique. It's a stage in life where meditativeness just flows. Yoga Nidra, on the other hand, doesn't require focus. It's the opposite. It just requires relaxation and no focus at all. And as you relax, you come into a state of well-being. I want to introduce you to a little bit of the history of Yoga Nidra before we get into the benefits. For those of you who are not very clear about what we are talking about, it's not just Shavasana. Yoga Nidra is a seven stages, it's a detailed process of body-mind relaxation. Now, in terms of the conscious mind, subconscious mind and unconscious mind, the cycles per second or the hertz in which it's, me it's measured, if you're 13 to about 24 cycles, thought cycles per second, we call it the conscious mind activity. When you're from about 4 to 7 CPS, we call it subconscious. And when you're from 0 to 4 CPS, we call it unconscious. Now, first you've got the beta waves, subconscious you've got the theta waves and unconscious, the delta waves. There is this gap between 9 to 12 cycles per second, which is alpha waves. Now, this is known in psychology as the hypnagogic state. We call this the yoga nidra state. Why is it important? Why should we train? We'll come to all of that. But I just want you to understand that this is a unique state of mind in between sleep and wakefulness. So just let this be the definition. It is a state between sleep and wakefulness. When you're completely awake, the conscious mind is active. When you're completely asleep, you've got the sub and unconscious mind active. In between this borderline state, that's the word that we got to remember, it's a borderline state. A little bit about the history. In the 1960s, Swami Satyanand, at that point Satyanand Saraswati had joined his guru, in the 1950s rather, 
Swami Shivananda, legendary Swami Shivananda from Rishikesh. Now, as a young uh, man, he was about 20 years of age when he joined, he was given the task of going to a school where young boys were learning the Vedic system. So their teacher was traveling, so he was given the job to go there and spend the night there almost as a guardian for these boys in the school. So he would stay awake as they slept. At about 3 o'clock or, or so, he'd get there from, from 12 to 3, he'd be awake. At about 3, he'd go to sleep. And then he'd get up at 6 and go back to his own Shiv, Swami Shivananda's ashram. Now, what was intriguing was that the children would get up at about 4 o'clock, they'd have their ablutions, and then they would start in the Vedic system to do the chanting of the mantras. And as they did the chanting of the mantras, uh, during that course that would happen, and then later on, the day started for them with studies. It so happened a few months down the line, the boys were invited to, the, to Swami Shivananda's ashram and they were performing the mantras. Now, as they were performing the mantras, Swami Satyanand started to feel that he's heard this before. He had never heard it before, but he just started to feel he knows all of this. So he went up to the teacher and asked them, asked the teacher, you know, how is this that I know this? So the, the, the teacher of the boys, what he told him was like a silver bullet for Swami Satyananda. He said that, yeah, of course you've heard this. They're doing this every morning while you're sleeping. Now, you and me, we have only studied through the conscious mind. We've gone to school, college, we've listened to a teacher talk, or we've studied by reading. It's all been through the senses, it's been through the conscious mind. For Swami Satyananda, this was intriguing because it meant that he had learned something while he was asleep. So he started to research in the library, in the ashram, the different ancient practices to find some sort of an understanding of what was happening to him, what had happened to him. He came across some tantra practices called Nyasa Kriya, which bring about this borderline state wherein the mind, the subconscious mind is open or you have access to the subconscious and the uh, unconscious realms. Now please remember in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, apart from the Ashtanga system, Asan, Pranayam, all of that, he describes another way to enlightenment, another way to Samadhi, where he says that if you can integrate what is happening to you when you sleep, what's going on in the mind when you sleep, with what is happening to you when the, in the mind when you're wakeful, that will create Samadhi. Now, this is fascinating because we seem to feel that we know who we are. And yet, for about 7-8 hours every night, we have no idea who we are. Therefore, to have, as Socrates would say, know thyself, to really know who you are, you have to be able to integrate what's going on in your sleep state with your wakeful state. This was the premise under which the Tantra systems had described these practices. So Swami Satyanand started to experiment. Now, for example, in the Nyasa Kriya of Tantra, you would relax the different body parts with a specific mantra for each. Now, when he modified it to the current Yoga Nidra protocol, he removed the mantra so that people from across the world, it was no more language or culture dependent, even they could practice. So as, as you know today when we practice it, we are just imagining the different body parts. We are probably saying right thumb, index finger, middle finger, like that and relaxing. I've done another video with the entire Yoga Nidra practice. You can try that and you'll see that now the same practice has been done but without these mantras. So he made it something that could become, as it is today, a global practice. What he discovered is that he was able to transform people through making them relaxed. Any amount of sermonizing was not working on these people, but when he put them through Yoga Nidra, they were transforming, including prisoners. He, he brought this down. He said that when a person is relaxed, they are natural. Now, if you want to give up a bad habit or some unhealthy habit, the reason that you do that habit is simply because you're not relaxed. In a state of stress, the body asks for certain 
or not ask for, but you end up maybe say smoking or drinking or eating wrongfully. When you're relaxed, you're so natural that you don't require those stimulants and so on and so forth. That's just a very rudimentary example. The real benefit of yoga nidra is the major changes in life. Transformation was happening through yoga nidra. So like this, he built this protocol. He speaks about training one of his students, a really naughty boy. And what he found is that he was able to train the boy. He wanted to train the boy in the Bhagavad Gita, in the mantras and so on. So he would play these mantras while the boy was sleeping. And then he'd make the, when the boy woke up, the boy was training to be a Swami. He would make him then recite or listen to it once. And immediately he was picking it up. So what the boy was doing was that he was able to learn during the sleep state when the conscious mind was at rest, he was able to absorb that. And when he integrated the conscious mind with, after waking up uh, with, uh, with the sleep mind, with the conscious mind, then learning was complete. So this fascinated him. He was able to train the boy in many different languages like this. And he started exploring, Swami Satyananda started exploring how to make Yoga Nidra accessible to people. And this is how today we have the practice of Yoga Nidra. Now there are seven stages in the Yoga Nidra practice. The first is, so you're lying down in Shavasana, you've covered yourself with a blanket usually. The first stage, you're listening to the different sounds. Now this is the opposite of what you want to do. You want to internalize, but what you're doing is you're listening to the different sounds. And as you listen to the different sounds, what happens is you're telling your mind to go out there and listen. But over the course of a few minutes, a couple of minutes, the mind gets bored and starts to internalize. So actually, you want the mind focused, but you're asking it to do the reverse. If you try to focus, it'll do everything else. There's a beautiful understanding of how the mind operates. So that's the first stage, listening. The second stage is relaxing the different body parts. Now, each body part has a part of the brain that's connected to that body part. If I relax my thumb, the part of my brain that is controlling my thumb can switch off. Like that, I slowly switch off different parts of the brain. When I say switch off, I mean relax different parts of the brain by re relaxing different parts of the body. The somatopsychic, the body back to mind connection is utilized here. This is a very, very important way to completely relax. I would like you to sort of check out pictures of motor humunculus. This is an image of a human being with grotesque proportions simply because this image is designed based on the amount of grey area in the brain dedicated to different parts of the body. So the amount of brain matter that is uh, connected to the palm, for example, is so high that if you were to draw a man based on the area the square area of the brain that's dedicated to the palm, the palm would look so big as compared to the forearm, arms and so many other parts of the body. The lips, the hands, the feet will end up looking really massive. That is why when you're relaxing the body, you spend time with the thumb, index finger, middle finger, but you just say forearm and move on. It's designed like that to switch off, to relax those parts. So first was listening. Second, relaxing the body. The third part of Yoga Nidra deals with uh, a very important aspect, deals with breathing. So as you relax your breathing, immediately your body-mind relaxes deeply. So deep breathing to relax. The fourth is fascinating. You start to visualize opposites, extreme cold. And if you're creative, if the mind is really creative, the body can even shiver. Extreme heat heaviness, lightness, like that. So when you work with this kind of uh, practices, because the mind is not used to experiencing these opposites instantaneously. So because it's doing something different, it starts to relax. The fifth stage is also very interesting. You start to visualize different uh, uh, experiences, right? So at the eyebrow center, you start to visualize sunrise, for example, common one, sunrise, a river, 
uh, mountains and so on and so forth. Now, for somebody, for most of us, sunrise is a beautiful thing. But for somebody, maybe at sunrise, they lost a loved one. And therefore, it can be traumatic. Similarly, mountains can be traumatic for somebody. It's beautiful for most people. A river can be traumatic. Like that, when you are asking people to sort of visualize these things, some people, you'll find when you're teaching that, or when you're practicing, sometimes the body just shakes. Because there's a memory there, there's samskara, there's an impression locked in, in that relaxed state it's surfacing. Like that, when people are able to experience a traumatic ex uh, memory in a relaxed state, it helps with them integrating that as part of their life and healing. The sixth stage is very fascinating because you work with a sankalp. A sankalp is a deep resolve or resolution. A sankalp is very, very important. If you don't have a sankalp, you continue to do today what you did yesterday and tomorrow what you're doing today. Man is a creature of habit, so the neuronal pathways get fixed and you keep doing the same thing. But so habits repeat and repeat. But when you take on a sankalp, you're saying that, no, I want this as a goal. Then your day-to-day -day behavior may change because it can be in tune with your long-term sankalp. The thing with sankalp, for most of us, we take it as a conscious mind decision. The conscious mind is not a fertile ground for this thing. It has to go into the sub and unconscious mind for it to really take root. Now you take a resolution on Jan 1st, by Jan 2nd you say, ah, it's not really worth it. Why does this happen? The nature of the mind is such, but when it goes into the subconscious in Yoga Nidra, then the real benefit starts. The seventh stage, so the first stage was listening. The second stage, relaxing the body. Third, breathing slowly. Fourth, visualizing, imagining opposites. Fifth, visualizing at the eyebrow center certain experiences. Sixth, this idea of sankal, rooting the sankal. So we normally say, be aware of your sankal, repeat it three times. It's a seed that you're sowing in the depths of your consciousness, like that. The seventh one is again back to listening and coming out of the state. This is the Yoga Nidra protocol as been given by Swami Satyanand Saraswati. And this is the way we normally practice. I would like to, in fact, the main main aim of this video is to share with you the benefits of Yoga Nidra. Now in the benefits of Yoga Nidra, there are five major benefits as I've studied this. I've been teaching Yoga Nidra since 2003. It's a great area of interest for me. Many years ago, I had the fortune of teaching a lady uh, a yoga class and every day I would teach this person. And uh, when I would teach her, her dog would be running all over the place. She had a Russell Terrier. And it was a very sort of frisky kind of a dog, you know, as Russell Terriers are. The interesting thing is that as soon as I would change my voice to say, begin to relax or lie down on your back, immediately the dog would just jump and plonk itself down, would just fall asleep. For the next 20 minutes, as, the, as I continue to teach Yoga Nidra, the dog would be dozing. And when I would start to say, start to stretch your fingers, toes, and turn to one side and come up, immediately the dog would get up and it'd be wondering where it was. I don't know how much the lady practiced or learned Yoga Nidra, the dog was surely getting it. This intrigued me and I started to sort of study more and more. And I found that Swami Satyanand Saraswati in his, in his memoirs speaks about how he trained his dog in Yoga Nidra. So this is an area of interest for me. So I've studied it and I've studied the benefits of it from different perspectives. And I've, I think there are five major benefits. The first is total relaxation. Now, tensions are of three kinds. You've got muscular tension, which a massage or some asana practice can take care of. You've got mental tensions, just the nature of the mind. If you're happy, then later you'll be sad. Uh, the nature of the mind is to keep alternating between two states. And then you've got emotional tensions. Now, for example, when you were young, you didn't do certain things in life. When you're old, now you have to do it because it's playing in your mind. 
uh, you may be in a perfect marriage, for example, but certain uh, you, you were not in different relationships and now you're craving that. So small things like that, a lot of our behavior is sort of motivated by emotional tensions. On the face of it, we may be living a perfect looking life to somebody else, but we have so many emotional tensions that need to be expressed. Yoga Nidra is very effective because it takes care of all three, muscular, mental and emotional tensions. Now please don't undervalue the need and the meaning of relaxation. A lot of people feel relaxation is something to be done on the weekend, it's something to be done when you're on holiday. No, relaxation is fundamental to the way you live. This is the first thing you need to do and build your life around it. Because when you're relaxed, you're natural. When you're not relaxed, you're unnatural. You cannot push yourself, work hard, work hard, and then hope to relax on the weekend. It's not, it's not the approach in yoga. You first become relaxed, then you build your life. Whatever you do with life then will be right and good. So relaxation. The second point is somewhere connected. All of them are connected, of course. The second one is transformation. Now, you can sermonize any amount. You can tell a person, you know, everybody knows, for example, that smoking is bad for health. You don't need to tell a person that it's understood. But then how does a person give up the habit? It will only happen when the person is completely relaxed, when there's no stress, there's no need for a person to then smoke. Yeah, I'm just giving a very simple example. I don't mean it from a moral perspective at all, you know. But it could be anything. It could be any habit. Uh, so a lot of people get tense, ang anxious. When you're completely relaxed, that anxiety doesn't happen. So transformation, people behave in a certain way. They may be sort of insecure or they behave in a certain way because that they are not relaxed. So the main focus should be, how do you relax a person? How do you relax yourself? So that, when that happens, transformation happens. People change. They give up habits. They change habits. They change life. They change relationships. Simply because now they are completely relaxed. So transformation. The third is learning. As we've studied with Swami Satyanand's experiments, when you want to learn, the conscious mind is not the best place to learn a new thing. You have to have a carte blanche sometimes to learn. You need to have a whiteboard, a clean slate. When, say you're listening to me, you're listening about Yoga Nidra, those ideas that resonate with you, you, you continue to absorb. Those that don't resonate, you reject. This is the way the mind is. But the subconscious mind is very, very different. Anything can go in. Yeah, so therefore, it's a great place to learn. Now, most learning happens in the first five years of age. That's why people can pick up, children can pick up languages like that. In the first five years, the neuronal pathways are getting created. After that, it happens at a much slower rate. Try learning a new language as an adult. You know how difficult it is, right? A new skill, a musical instrument, so many things. It can be done. But to be able to do it, you need to use different aspects of your mind better. It is said that if you can do it, like if you want to learn a language, you play it while you're sleeping and then listen to it when you're awake. The learning gets integrated and you're able to pick up this new language. Like that, it's important for you to constantly keep learning in life. Yeah? In the, in the generation that we live in, it's imperative that you're consistently learning, otherwise you won't have a career. To be consistently learning, it's important to also use the sub and unconscious mind. Now, in today's knowledge economy, you're as good as the amount of knowledge that you have. To be able to get in that knowledge, it's good to learn in the yoga nidra state. It's very good also to learn musical instruments and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, or for a musician to learn new tunes, that is a good set. Anything that requires memory, whether you have to learn sut uh, sutras or mantras or some such, 
It's very good. The fourth one is creativity. Creativity is very, very unique. People don't think through a new idea. They don't labor through a new idea. It flashes. Now, what is the meaning of this flashing? Newton spent a lifetime studying the laws of physics. But in a state of inspiration, when the apple falls on his head, in that state of inspiration, he is able to sort of get that illumination of gravity. Archimedes is in the bathtub. Suddenly it dawns on him that the amount of water that he displaces in the bathtub is equivalent to the volume of his body. These are Eureka moments. The Buddha tried effort, so much effort to reach. He couldn't reach truth. Once he gave up, he ate food and relaxed. Enlightenment happened. Which means that you've got to put in effort, effort, effort. And then you've got to relax. And then these moments happen. Michelangelo, a lot of effort, no inspiration, goes to relax, suddenly sees the clouds and understands and visualizes the creation of Adam painting in the Sistine Chapel. He does that, what he saw in a relaxed state. Artistic inspiration, scientific inspiration, spiritual inspiration. All the great discoveries of, our, of, of mankind have happened in this state. This is why the Yoga Nidra state or the hypnagogy, the alpha state, is so significant. This is something that we got to train and use. It doesn't mean that if you start doing Yoga Nidra, tomorrow you will become Michelangelo. That's not the point. The point is that you will find creative ways to solve your day-to-day -day problems. You'll be able to see issues slightly differently. I hope that was a good sort of uh, explanation of learning and creativity for you. The fifth Benefit of yoga, that's perhaps the most important, self-discovery. Now, if you really don't know who you are, can you be completely relaxed? Can you really learn, be creative, all these things? Very important to make a discovery, a self-discovery of who you really are. Now, this is very, very significant. And if you can do this through the art of Yoga Nidra, it will give you a lot of insight in that Yoga Nidra state about who you are. And this knowledge is very beneficial for all of us. So There you have it, five main benefits. You've got the first benefit of relaxation, transformation, learning, creativity and self-discovery. Knowing who you are will improve every aspect of your life and well-being. Not knowing who we are puts us in a lot of confusion through life. Finally, I'd like to share this experiment done by Swami Rama in the Meninja Foundation in Texas uh, in 1971. So that is the first time the yoga or a yogi was being experimented upon. He had electrodes in the brain. The experiment in the head, the experiment was that he will stay five minutes in the conscious mind, as can be measured by cycles per second, 13 and above. The next five, he will go into the subconscious between four to seven. Now he's doing this willfully. And the last five, he'll do it unconsciously. He'll go into unconscious mind from zero to four. This is not some, uh, you know, uh, bunkum in that sense that he's just saying that I was subconscious or unconscious. It can be measured. He's, you're measuring it. So much so that when he did the experiment, first fight, second fight, the last five minutes he was snoring. If I were to ask you to just start snoring, you won't be able to do it. You don't have the mastery of the mind, I don't have the mastery of the mind, to just suddenly change from conscious to unconscious. But he had that. Now, he's a fabulous yogi, there's a beautiful book up, uh, about him, Walking with the Himalayan Master, which is well worth checking out. Swami Rama, Train, train, he's a master of his mind. This is the first time this is being seen in a modern laboratory. Yogis have been talking since eternity about mastery of the mind, but it has never been seen. So this experiment got done and this opened up psychology to the power of yoga. What is more interesting is that in the last five minutes when he was snoring, later on he was able to tell the 
researchers what questions they were asking him while he was snoring. Now please put this in perspective. His body is snoring, but there's a part of him obviously that's aware and awake. This is what modern psychology then started to call superconscious. In yoga, it's called Turaya. Turaya means fourth. Now, till then, from Freud, we had understood conscious, subconscious, unconscious, but modern psychology changed after these kind of experiments. In yoga, we've always been talking about Turaya state, but it was proven there. Now, you know this, you put an alarm for 5 a.m., you get up at 4.59. It happens all the time. There's a part of you that's always awake. You've got to connect to that. Connecting to that part of you is the art of yoga. So, there you have it. You have the subconscious mind, subconscious, unconscious. And then you've got this Turaya state. If you see the symbol of Om, the first circle is conscious mind, second is subconscious, the tail-like pattern is unconscious, and then the Bindu, the crescent and the dot, is Turaya state. This proved that there is this very important state that needs to be explored for us to get better at life, at relaxation, transformation, learning creativity and self-discovery. We have access to our sub and unconscious minds there. The hypnagogic state, the alpha state. It's up to us to make yoga nidra a daily practice. Now we are interested always in finding how can this transform my body as we've discussed. Health, vitality, general well-being improves, how can it improve my mind, learning, creativity, stress, how can it improve prana, energy, this knowledge of yourself, of who you are, completely transforms you. I invite you to check out the other video with the Yoga Nidra and to please practice it. Get into a dark space, you can cover your light, your eyes with an uh, iPad and Practice yoga and make it a daily routine. You can do it in the afternoon as an afternoon nap. Or you can do it in the night as a precursor to sleep. But make it a daily routine. The times we live in, especially with the pandemic and generally also, the immunity levels are going so low that something like yoga nidra can really boost. If you're not getting your eight hours of sleep in the night, please include yoga nidra as part of your routine. It will transform you, it will relax you, it will raise your immunity, improve the quality of your sleep. You might also get smarter in the process. Please do write to me, share comments here about yoga. I'm always curious to know whether these practices are benefiting you. And please do write in and let me know. Thanks once again and off you go. Try a little bit of yoga nidra for yourself. Namaste.